Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting today on Wajak Noongar Buja and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so my name's Miranda, I'm the Public Programs Manager here at PICA. Um, unfortunately, Natalie Marino, who is going to be facilitating, is not able to come today due to being unwell. Um, and Elam Eshragayan, who is one of our speakers, is also not able to be here. Um, so I'm going to facilitate in Natalie's place. Um, I don't have a background in XR, so I apologise in advance. <laughs> um, but we've got two incredible speakers um, here today, so they'll be covering a lot of that. Um, so I thought I'd just start by letting everyone know that we are recording today. Um, so if you don't want to be recorded, just let our um, usher know. And we'll have some Q&A at the end. So if you are asking a question, please just wait for the microphone um, because we're recording the audio through the mic. Um, so yeah, please use that microphone. Um, so we put on this panel today um, because Pika's currently doing an EOI call out for artists and developers um, to participate in the Hackathon project, um, which we did for the first time last year and we received some funding from the DLGSC to do the panel um, and the Hackathon again this year, which is really exciting. Um, and yeah, it kind of made us realise that there was a, a lot of artists and creatives who were really interested in XR mediums but didn't really have any avenue through which to develop their skills. Um, so we're really excited about presenting this project. Um, so yeah, the panel is kind of a way to kick off the 2022 hackathon, um, but also to hear from some experts working in the field of XR about um, the creative possibilities and their experiences of the medium. Um, so I introduce our panel today, um, starting with Gareth Lockett. So Gareth is the technical director and co-founder of Frame Labs. Before founding Frame, Gareth worked in the local multimedia, 3D animation and digital media industry for over 20 years. Um, and Ian Wilkes. Ian Wilkes is a Noongar man with connection to the Wadjuk and Baladong people. He is a past graduate of Aboriginal theatre at Wapa and now a theatre maker, performer and director. Current credits include co-creator and lead performer in Gallup VR Experience and co-director of the 2022 Perth Festival event Noongar Wonderland. In 2021, Ian was Artistic Associate for Waitco's Beside and co-director of York for Black Swan Theatre. Also in 2021, Ian won the Perth NADOC Award for Artist of the Year and is currently working as an Associate Artist with Perth Festival. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, so I thought we'd start by handing over to the two of you to talk a little bit about your projects that you've worked on, particularly those that include XR. And we've got a little bit more time, so feel free to speak as much as you want. I'll kind of wave at you if we're going over. Um, so Gareth, I thought we'd start with you. Sure. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out today. I know it's a bit of a miserable day out there weather-wise, so thanks for being here and thanks for taking interest in XR. Uh, let's have a quick look. So as Miranda said, so I'm Gareth. I'm uh, what they call a technical director at Frame Labs. So uh, in short, a technical director, it's basically my job to solve technical and creative problems to make them happen. Uh, so they're either on our own projects or with clients, you know, we'll come up with amazing ideas or people come up with amazing ideas and it's largely my job to figure out how we actually do that, uh, what sort of hardware and software we use and what processes we use to actually make that happen. So to avoid a little bit of confusion also, so when we first founded the company back in 2016, mid-2016, um, myself and my co-founder, Justin, uh, we've, it was called Frame VR at the time, but we've recently pivoted to being called Frame Labs. I'll talk a little bit about why we did that in a sec. Uh, but when we first sort of founded the company, we decided uh, up front that, um, oh, I should actually say, so Justin's background is kind of in film and television and, and media, like multimedia back in the 90s and early 2000s. And in my background, I, I've been doing this kind of digital media stuff for tw 20 plus years now. I've got grey hair to prove it. Uh, so in the, in the mid-90s, I was doing like multimedia stuff. I was doing web stuff. Um, in, in sort of 2000s, I, I got into kind of social media stuff, apps, and all sorts of bits and pieces. So I've done lots of stuff. Uh, for 10 years, I ran a 3D animation company here in Perth as well, uh, before Founding Frame. So we both kind of had a background in this kind of technology, kind of storytelling uh, world. Um, and then uh, we sort of caught up in, in 2015. Uh, we sort of knew each other from around the industry. And we decided, hey, this, this VR stuff is coming out. It's really cool, really exciting, a new platform for telling stories. So we sort of founded a company and, and sort of started doing stuff. But like I was going to say, uh, when we first founded the company, we decided we weren't going to do any one particular type of, of project. So we, we could have gone into doing, like, training for, you know, the mining industry. We're in WA, there's tons of that kind of work floating around. Or we could have done, like, arts projects or, or some other type of thing. But we decided we're just going to kind of sort of see what comes up and, and sort of work on, on different types of things. So it was a pretty busy first couple of years. Um, uh, I'll, I'll switch to the other slide in a sec to tell you. Uh, but... All the projects we did 
in the first probably four years of the company, we can probably break down into there are either arts projects, training projects, or entertainment projects. And then in late 2019, early 2020, we decided we're going to kind of pivot the company a little bit more and focus a bit more. It's very hard to uh, raise funding from investors when you do a bit of everything. They want you to do one thing really well. So we've decided we're going to sort of focus on VR gaming. It's a, it's a really big growing kind of industry. Um, you can actually make money in it. And we can kind of leverage all the skills and, and experience that we have out of doing other projects. So some of the types of projects we've done, and, and I think at last count, we've done over 50 projects over the last six years. Uh, we've done things, we're probably best known for, for um, Dalu up there in the top right-hand corner. So this is an indigenous project. We worked with some storytellers from up in Robin, up in the Pilbara. Uh, we built this kind of festival piece. It kind of takes you in, into um, the sort of Nullamar community and sort of belief system. Uh, we've done things with, uh, in the top left there, we, we went and did a project with uh, the Perth Concert Hall and, and Wazio, the WA Symphony Orchestra. We sort of filmed Wazio doing performances of Beethoven Symphony, uh, sort of wrapped all that up. Uh, we've done lots of um, uh, training things as well. So, again, we are in WA, so resources sector is huge. So we had like, Woodside come in, BHP and Rio Tinto. So we've done little bits of those kind of jobs. At the very sort of beginning of the company, we kind of thought that was going to be a bread and butter, but it hasn't really panned out that way. Um, what we kind of found with a, a lot of those big companies, particularly in training, it, it takes a long time for them to change how they train. Uh, so, we, so we kind of did some prototypes for them, but it didn't really sort of turn into anything. Uh, and then we've done a whole bunch of like little games and things, just little fun things. We've been to lots of festivals, uh, done lots of bits and pieces there. We came up with this really crazy project called the Mechatron. It's, a, it's a basically like a theme park ride. It has a platform, six seats, and you can tilt left and right and front and back. So we kind of reverse engineered that, uh, put people in VR on that and take them for a bit of a roller coaster ride. It's really kind of fun. Uh, we've done projects with the State Library as well. We did this Reflections of Ivanov project last year. Uh, so Ivan Ivanov is, is a well-known uh, architect uh, around WA and Australia from, from the, like, the 1950s, 1960s. Basically, we, we took uh, some of the original plans um, from that time and sort of rebuilt them in VR for a particular house that, that no longer exists or was knocked down in the 90s. So you could sort of experience that kind of work over there. So lots and lots of different types of things. Um, my, my full spiel about all the things we've done goes for like 45 minutes, so I won't cover all that. Uh, so, yeah, so we've done lots of things, but of course, uh, it's not just Justin and I, we're, we, you know, we do as much as we can, but we can't do everything ourselves, so we've been lucky enough to work with over 70 people in the last um, six years or so, uh, pretty, pretty diverse range of people from artists and animators and um, musicians, composers, uh, directors, all, all sorts, basically, and all sorts of different types of projects, um, and that kind of brings us up to where we're at at the moment, so I might throw over to Ian and talk a bit about what, what Ian does. Um, Kaya, everyone. Uh, hello. Um, I just want to thanks, say thanks for coming again um, and welcome to Wajak Nyunga Buja. As a Wajak man, it's important to me to make sure that acknowledgements happen, so thanks, Miranda, for that um, acknowledgement. But um, here on Wajak Buja, I feel comfortable and I'm here. This is kind of the land that my ancestors travelled for many, many thousands of years, and so it's important for me to hold that knowledge of intergenerational importance, you know, so from my fathers and my mothers and my grandmothers and my grandfathers, um, I stand on their shoulders and I walk the track easier because of them, and I think we all do, so wanju wanju with nita, wajak buja, ngala buja, our land now, so it's not just wajak buja, not just nunga buja, we all live here, we all call this place home. Um, and I am not only a, an Aboriginal artist, I'm a performing artist, a director like Miranda introduced me there with that beautiful, I think she took the whole bio, I was like, just kind of cut that if you can. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, but thanks for that big intro too. Um, I'm, I'm a performing artist, I, I don't, whenever I like to introduce myself, whether it's for certain elements of my craft, um, people say, introduce me as the actor or the dancer or the performing artist or the director, whatever, I, I'm always banging on about that that doesn't define me. In my culture, everything is included or interconnect or, or to say that the one thing is, is the, the thing I go on. You know, our stories don't exist without our music. Our music don't exist without our, our dance and our, our... All of that is just connected. And so that's how I like to kind of promote myself is I'm never one of those single things. I'm always all of them at the same time. 
So I like to make sure that I do that within my artistry, within my craft, and keep all avenues open because that's who I am, that's how I was raised, that's Noongar culture, 101. Um, I was raised um, here in Perth, taught a little bit of dance, a little bit of culture, a little bit of um, language, so I'm comfortable speaking the language which has al almost been, you know, extinct and wiped out from this planet, this mother tongue of Perth, Urlu, Nichawajakuja. It's um, something that's important to me to carry through as well, through all my work, is making sure the language stays strong, because that's how we communicate, first up, bang, talking, jawani. Um, and so I began to kind of get involved with performing arts as a young man, as a teenager, and as an um, adult through my life. I studied at WAPA and then started doing a lot of theatre and contemporary dance. I started mixing contemporary dance with a lot of my um, Noongar traditional dance. Um, so I felt very comfortable on stage. I felt very comfortable performing in front of people. And then that grew to writing, that grew to directing, that grew to just all these doors that I was walking into that people kind of box in. I was just like, no, nah, I can go there, I can go there, I can go there, I can do this. And VR was one of them. So I stepped into the world of VR quite recently. I'm not an expert. I'm not, um, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I've just created this beautiful VR film um, recently. And so that's why I'm here. Um, it's, a, it's a film that I can talk about soon, or now, maybe. I'll have a look at this. Um, so we, uh, a friend of mine, Poppy Van Ord, uh, Van Ord Granger, I always get her name wrong and she gets mad at me, um, she um, did this beautiful show together with me around Lake Munga. Um, we call that place Garlap, which means place of fire. And many years ago, that lake would dry up and Noongar people would camp around that area um, on the dry mud and it was a big meeting place for all Noongar people. And so there was a lot of campfires. That's why that place is called Garlap, place of fire. It's hard to imagine with a big lake there full of water. Um, but this project that we did about Garlap was based on a massacre that happened there that not many people know about. And so we wanted to bring awareness to this story we wanted to bring awareness to the history. Um, and we did this live show with Perth Festival around the lake. And that was because I'm a performer and I love people and I wanted to kind of share my culture and get everyone familiar with not only the story but theatre and who I am and share my dance and culture. So I'll quickly do a run of, a rundown of the live show that we created um, and then I'll talk about how we developed it into a VR and what that process was like. Um, so the, the live show, basically, this is an aerial view of Lake Munga, Garlap. We started over the bridge at the freeway there, um, where it says smoke. Um, we started away from the lake. The story begins with me introducing about a group of 15 members of audience. We didn't want it to be too big. It had to be small and intimate. It's outside, so it's very hard to control an audience of 300 with one single performer. <laughs> I was the single performer, but we um, had an elder with us working, who's no longer with us. She's passed away just recently, but she was the custodian of the story that we were trying to tell about the massacre. Um, she was told this story, um, and it was passed down through her grandmother. Um, Nana Dolan Leisha Eats is her name, and she was a powerful old woman. Me and Poppy went around her kitchen table. She was the first one that um, a lot of the Noongar mob said, go speak to her about that area and that lake and that story, and we did. Um, and she was a vital part of this story because she held the massacre story, the oral history, against some of the written history, um, which we discovered wasn't necessarily truthful in its approach, some of those old colonial records, but I won't get too far down the track. So this live show began there with me and Nan, and we did a, a smoking. Um, once we entered the lake, we went up and... Um, I taught the audience how to throw a spear with a mural, which is a difficult thing to do, and we reenacted a spear throwing competition that was held at Lake Munga by um, a few Noongars and a few Wajalas. Wajalas is our word for white people. It's not necessarily derogative or offensive in any way, it's just Wajala. Um, so this old spear throwing contest happened there with a Noongar leader called Yagen, um, and so I reenact some things, and then we do a bit of dance around the lake are fun. We, we reenact a lot of these um, 
truthful events that we found out happened at Lake Munga. Um, so we, we do a bit of dance and then there's some, the ration station is something else that um, <clears throat> was at the lake. A lot of Noongar people, once our land started getting farmed and um, we had to get pushed out of our own land, we couldn't hunt and we couldn't get our own natural supply of food. So there was many ration stations where flour, biscuits and sugar was given to Noongar people by the Wajala and Lake Munga was one of them. Um, and then we end with a fire and Nan gets to tell the story of the massacre to the audience. Um, that's a quick rundown of the live show. So we started over the bridge. Um, I take the audience around, the smoking. I um, told you about the spear throwing competition um, where we get people involved. We're trying to hit that little stick on the ground there, yeah? Um, from about 20 metres away. So the story goes that Jägen is our strong leader back our resistance fighter. He was the good marksman and he could throw the spear and um, hit the mark from about 20 to 30 metres away. Um, he was one of the only men who could do that. And so I had to try and do that. I had to try and be Hagen. It was very hard, let me tell you. Um, and then we do a bit of traditional dance around there. Um, and I play a character called Jack Munga Benel. And Jack Munga Benel is one of the first Noongar Wajala people um, in Perth. And the reason for this is his father was the Wajala, the white man who that lake is named after, Munga, John Munga. His father was a white man and his mother was a Wajak woman. And Benel was the name that came from that. And that's a huge Noongar family in our community now. And they all stem from this one character that, that is um, a descendant of Lake Munga, John Munga Benel. Um, so I played, I played a spirit of him as I guided the audience around this incredible show. And that's Nana Dolan sitting on the bench. She holds the story. She holds the knowledge. Um, she's no longer with us, but she is a deadly, deadly old elder and quite respected in our community. Um, it was an incredible journey to be a part of the live show. And then as we developed the, the VR, it was a bit of a shock to us just before launching it. She passed away this year, so... Um, she told us just before um, launching the VR, um, keep going, um, do not take a backward step. I want my story to be told, I want my name to be there. Um, don't let anyone tell you you can't say my name or see my image or do anything like that. That's not my way. I know there's certain protocols around Aboriginal culture and people, but I don't want that. I want my voice to be heard. Um, so we did, and that's how we developed into the, the aspect of the VR. Um, we wanted this story to be heard more. We wanted to create awareness around this history because it's important um, for many reasons and I don't want to speak too long. These are the um, creatives that were involved. There's um, four elders up the top. I won't explain who everyone is, but Poppy, who I um, told you is sitting next to Nan there, and that's Nana Dolan, and Pop Walter, and... Sam, the grandson at the back, he, he jumped on board as an assistant stage manager and handled out things. So it was a very family, intimate thing that we created. Um, and the elders at the top looked after us. There was four of them, five of them now. Um, I'll, I'll click along. Um, and then we began the, the journey of the VR. And there's the camera. And I, we had to switch up. That's my son there, Calvin. He's in the VR with me. Um, and that's the smoking. We did a virtual kind of smoking before we, we created anything else to make sure that the audiences kind of get an aspect of what, what our culture is to begin with. Um, and so the, the, the project of the VR wasn't just about planting the camera and doing the live show. We had to kind of quickly switch our narrative to kind of create the film and let it sit within that 360 realm and I had to quickly kind of create a new script and it had to be a narr narrator and all of that. And we did some um, footage across the lake with some drones, which was beautiful. Um, and what else can I say? Uh, two deadly singers, that's my uncle and um, my sister, my cousin, sister, Jook. Della there, so Uncle Nigel and Della, they, they helped with a lot of the singing and a lot of the sounds that we, we hear through our, through our experience. And we launched it not long ago at the museum over here, um, Gallup VR Experience. 
And we basically let um, audience into the world of Lake Munga, which is just a stone throw from the city of Perth. Um, and it's there, they got to enjoy um, many elements of that lake. It's a beautiful lake, beautiful wildlife there. There's a lot of cute baby ducks and swans and um, people jog around there and it's a recreational lake, it's beautiful. But it holds a dark, dark history and it's, well, not dark, it's, it's deep. Um, and so we want to kind of give people that knowledge so that that lake can be looked after, that land can be healed and we can all walk together in the future um, with, with more clarity and with more responsibility and acceptance and acknowledgement. So um, this was the VR launch. All the people involved, all the community came, and a lot of the elders came and just were blown away by it, um, what we created. Uh, there's a few names there. Um, I don't know what else we got. We have a um, social impact plan that we attach to this project as well. So the live show with Perth Festival and all the um, VR, we, I'll let you just kind of, I've kind of banged on about this already. We wanted to increase the awareness of the story of Lake Munga and Gallup. Um, and we wanted to make sure that, you know, the violence of settler colonialism, it still impacts us today. That's important to understand. Back then, this massacre was created by Wadjalas who wanted to um, assert their superiority. Um, and this is still happening today. So we just want to make sure that on both sides, we are struggling, like our community struggles because of events that happened 200 years ago. You know? And so we wanted to kind of make sure that that's still embedded here. Um, and we're going we're gonna to link the VR project over to schools now as well. So we wanted to make sure that this story is told um, in schools. I know it's a bit deep and dark. We're going to probably hit the high schools first, not the, the young ones. Um, but we're going to um, make sure that this is taught in schools because it's knowledge that we should all know. And unfortunately, our educational system isn't telling um, true history about this place that we're on. We know more about America and, and, and the UK than we do about our own neighbourhood. And so that's how this kind of project basically started, was Poppy living near Lake Munga, not knowing nothing about her local area. And she called me one day and said, hey, what do you know about Lake Munga? I want to do a show there. And I said, well, there was a massacre there. And that's how it all began. Um, so we want to make sure that this is taught in school so people don't have to feel the need to go watch a VR um, to discover this truth. They should already know it. Um, and I'll just click along. There's a website that we've got called galluptruth.com. Um, you can go there and find out a lot more stuff. I'm going to kind of, I feel like I've been banging on too long. Um, I'm going to leave it there um, because there's a lot more, there's a lot more stuff you can do. Check out the website if you can and there's a lot more references to the VR. There's a lot more references to some of the research that's been done through this project. Um, and yeah, it's just been an incredible experience for me as an artist stepping on to the balance of culture and the balance of what this new technology can do. It's been incredible. So I'm here to kind of yarn about that. And so any technical questions, I'll throw over to Gareth. <laughs> Just on that, though, I've, I've got to say this, because this comes up quite often. And, and, you know, I am a tech guy. I love this stuff. But uh, we were sort of talking about this before uh, the panel, about um, the tech stuff is really interesting. Like, it's fascinating stuff, and, you know, we can get caught yeah. up in that. But the really important thing about all this stuff is actually about human connection. That's really what it's about. It's about storytelling and connecting with each other. Um, we can have all the greatest tech in the world. At the end of the day, it's just a novelty. If you don't actually have something important or useful to say, then it's, it's just a novelty. And I, think, I think that's a great example of a project that, that communicates that. Thank you so much, Gareth and Ian, for um, sharing your experiences. So I've got a few questions um, to ask you both, and then we'll hand over to the audience. Um, so my first question is, how did you become interested in immersive technologies and was there a particular project or artist that inspired you? Whichever one of you wants to artist first, uh, answer first. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, okay, I don't have a direct answer for this, but I have a roundabout way of sort of talking about this. So, so before, um, I mentioned it briefly, before starting Frame, I, I did a whole bunch of other stuff. I ran an animation company that was highly technical as well. But my background is actually in the arts, really. I grew up like as a young kid drawing and painting, 
Uh, for high school, I got into a special art program, which meant five years. I went to high school like everybody else, did all the same homework and everything. But every Saturday, I went back to school, and we were taught like painting and drawing and printmaking and sculpture, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, towards the end of high school, in, I think you're 12, and I was doing my TE, I was still a TE thing around. I kind of specialised in like computer art. It wasn't really a thing at that point. This is like you know, early 90s sort of thing. Um, and, I, and, I, and I quite remember uh, some, of the, some of the work I did there, like illustrating um, for my TE. There actually wasn't a way to sort of, like computer art wasn't a thing, so they didn't have any really way to mark me on that, so I ended up getting stuck into like graphic design or something like that. So I kind of did that, and then in college, I, I went and did multimedia and got into that kind of stuff. But when I was at high school, one of the things that we did quite regularly as, as a special art kind of program is we would go out to like artist uh, practices. And one of the guys I really remember, and, and some of you might know him, um, Robert Juniper, uh, he's a well-known painter, yeah, does lots of things. And I remember going out, out to his uh, facility, I can't remember where it is, it's out, out country somewhere. And it was really fascinating uh, sort of talking to him at that point. Like, like I would have been like 15, 16 years old and, you know, crazy ideas, doing this arty stuff. Uh, but he was the first person I can remember who was like an adult who'd made a career out of this. And, and you know, the way he kind of spoke to us, it was like really important what he was kind of communicating through his work. So, so if anything, that would be someone who inspired me, but not necessarily because of his work. I mean, his work was great and everything, but it was him as a kind of artist showing us that, you know, you can actually do this as, as, as a sort of career sort of thing or to express yourself. Uh, the other thing I do, I do want to point out is also all the faceless masses in, in technology. So all these kind of engineers, like hardware and software engineers who make this stuff possible, they never get any thanks. It all just miraculously arrives and we use this technology to do cool things with. Uh, but they're probably the people who inspire me the most, those sorts of people. Um, I feel like I've already kind of spoken about my journey and how I kind of got into the, the realm and the experience of virtual reality and the film. Um, so I'll I'll leave that there, but um, yeah, I think just bang on with... Th there's a few people that kind of help guide that experience for me. Um, Poppy is one of them. So she was the one... She's a filmer and a vi videographer. She's kind of the camera tech kind of gal that kind of has all the knowledge behind that. And Yeah, yeah and, and well, she didn't know a lot about VR too. We had to kind of go and um, get, you know... VR 101 for dummies from people like Breesh and at Whitespark and some of the, I was yarning with Gareth earlier about some of the handy hints and tips that were given to us at the early division of creating the, the film, you know, just making sure we're doing it for the right reasons to begin with and, and making sure we do it the right way But because if we get the camera there on the lake, it's already too late if we've made mistakes, you know. So those quick handy little hints and... Um, tips were vital at the early beginning stage. So make sure you've got good people around you that know the, the world of, of, of that, that camera or that craft and take on their advice. Yeah. So my next question to you kind of builds on that. Um, so maybe you can expand a little bit. But did you experience any particular um, challenges sort of artistically or technically transferring the live show into the VR experience? Yeah, the, look, the biggest thing was how do we tell this old story, and not only the old 200-year-old story, but the, the stories that have been here for 50,000 years, how do we get all of that grounded culture into this new modern technology? And that was the, the first thing we wanted to make sure that we were approaching the right way, is will it work? Will, will this cultural stuff sit well within VR? And does this is this story good enough? And, and is the local area going to shine? Is it something that people want to see? All of those things that we wanted to make sure we were doing the right way. We wanted to cre create more audience, so we knew we wanted to make sure that VR was our, our gateway into that. But that was the biggest challenge, is making sure that um, stuff like the smoking is going to be perceived as, as something um, and Nan's story is going to be listened to and not be too kind of hectic with visuals and stuff like that. So there was, it was a thought out process. We had to shift the script a bit from over theatrical acting, um, Ian on stage, I get 
so excited sometimes when I play a character, so we quickly realised that that overactive character isn't going to work in this VR film. It needs to be softer. It needs to be um, narrator-driven, and so I had to switch my mind into narrator and give the audience guidance through what they're not only seeing but what they're hearing about this story. So that was the challenge, is how, how to kind of shift two cultures and make them meet this this other thing called VR, this world. And uh, we talked about it before, but even the process of kind of telling a linear narrative story in, in 360 video, it's actually quite a tricky thing to do. Um, I remember right at the beginning when we, when we found a frame, there were all these kind of like rules that were floating around about what you can and can't do in VR. And at the end of the day, we, you can't really believe any of those rules until you go and test them yourselves. And, and a lot of them have been disproved since. But you have these kind of issues where, OK, you're in this kind of 360 environment. People can look around anywhere. So how do you direct people to look at something specific that you want them to see that's important to the narrative and the story that you're conveying? So it becomes this very kind of tricky kind of process it's not like a linear 2D film where you, where you can kind of edit things together so you get your message across very clearly and specifically. You've got to kind of give the audience an opportunity to experience it. It's a very experiential medium. Uh, so you can't sort of push a linear narrative on them too hard. Yeah. Um, and do you have any, this is for both of you, do you have any advice for artists who want to get hands-on with XR? Yes, get a headset. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, so it is a very experiential medium. I, uh, over the last few years, I've, I've tried explaining it to people who've not tried it for themselves, and, and it's pretty much impossible to do that. You have to you just have to go and get a headset and put it on. Uh, there are various places you can go to do that. I know, I know the State Library has a couple of headsets now that you can go and check out some content on. Uh, there's stuff like, um, like your film that was on it for part of NADOC Week. Right? Yeah, it's at, closed at up museum. now, though. We closed last weekend, so... Yeah, so there's lots of bits and pieces. It'll be out and about in the schools. Yeah, lots of, pieces, lots of bits, bits and pieces around. I think most festivals now usually have a sidebar with some VR kind of stuff happening as well, yeah. but you've got to go and try it for yourself and, and try lots of different types of things. Again, if you purchase your own headset, that's ideal. And, and it's not too expensive. You can pick up a headset for under $1,000. And you can also apply yeah. for the boot camp where you have a chance <laughs> to experience a lot of different XR technologies. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, a plug. Yeah, I, I, I agree because um, something that... Breesh and, and Gareth really did kind of yarn about was checking out. We, we, I had to kind of do a lot of referencing and um, I get sick easily. I'm boat sick in two minutes. I, I get um, really nauseous around some. So there was a lot of early stuff that kind of made me get a bit sick watching VR and doing XR stuff. And um, But I, I pushed on and there was some that really sh like were standouts and those references and guides really inspired us to kind of do it the right way and make sure that um, we, what we wanted to create had similar elements. So we took some of the gold from what other films that we saw, which um, Gareth was a part of, and, um, you know, like I said, Breeze at White Spark and a lot of the other mob that kind of helped us through that process and just speaking, taking their advice, but then also going, well, I saw this. I experienced this. Um, what can you tell me how, you know... How's, what's the best approach to be able to kind of get something like that, you know? Um, and, and it does vary depending on what, what you're trying to convey. Mm. Uh, one of the very early uh, kind of rules that was sort of shopped around about 360 video is you should never roll the camera because the only time you ever really do that is when you're falling over sideways drunk or something like that. Mm. So people feel quite nauseous most of the time. Yet when we're working on our crazy Mechatron ride, literally half of what it does is tilt left and right. But we found... Uh, physically moving people, even only a small amount, was enough where we could actually also roll the camera as well. And we, we got to play all these kind of tricks on people. The, t the platform only tilted about 20 degrees, but we were able to roll the video like an extra 60 degrees and people think they're going right over. But it, but it worked in that context because we were trying to give them that kind of thrill ride. I think we'll hand over to audience questions now, um, but I just quickly wanted to wrap up by saying thank you to Ian and Gareth for sharing your experiences. Um, Poppy asked me to say as well that you can see the Gallup VR experience on the 8th of September at the City of Vincent Library, where Ian and Poppy are doing an artist talk. Um, and yeah, applications for the hackathon are open, so just go to the Pika website or send me an email if you have any questions. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions now, we'll ask you to keep it sort of specific to the panel discussion. Um, and if you'd like to ask any questions about the hackathon process or an idea that you've got for it, um, we're going to be meeting at the Alex Hotel after this for some food and drink, so feel free to ask us any questions. Um, so does anyone have any questions? 
Georgie will get a microphone for you. So you know we can't see anybody. So. Yeah, maybe we can put the lights up a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Um, I was just, I'm just curious how you, like how, how you were talking about directing the participants and getting them to see things specifically. How do you integrate sound? bunch of people with headsets on is are they all getting the same soundtrack or is it localized a little bit to different locations how do you how do you how do you do that um again i'm not too tech savvy when it comes to these things but um when creating this vr i expected us all to be wearing headphones and then i quickly learned after the process no that's not the case it'll be done in a i think they call it 7.1 surround. surround sound dolby so we had to kind of just work with that um, and one of the early tips that we always figured out was making sure that there's that central vocal point visual point um, and then sound will, will happen around um, so I, I'm, I'll let Gareth yarn a bit more in the um, text aspects of that but I, I thoroughly enjoyed um, going in to, to create the sound because mine was narrative driven too I had to be the narrator um, so we had to adjust um, the softness of what I was saying and making sure that the audience can hear me as the central thing and everything that happens around them comes in and out and around. Um, but yeah, the sound process after was done post in editing a lot of the time. Um, but other than that, yeah, that's all I can say. You want me to take yeah, yeah so there's sort of two formats um, that sort of kind of evolve. So there's what's called ambisonic sound. So this is kind of 3D positional sound. And it works best, as Ian said, like when you have headphones on, and people can kind of turn their heads and they can hear very specific sounds coming from very specific places, um, which works great. You can do all sorts of really crazy things with, with sound in that kind of space. You can put like sounds inside someone's head or you can have it coming from somewhere else around or even sort of start outside and then go inside someone's head. It's pretty crazy stuff. Sound engineers love this stuff, absolutely. Um, but generally what we, we found, and we, we built a piece of software for sort of playing back headsets in sync, so everyone would see the same thing, but we have the same sound played out around in speakers. Um, and generally what we found with that kind of format is um, it, it's actually really powerful when you can have a shared experience and you can hear the other people around you and what's going on. That, that I, think, I think particularly in a film kind of scenario, helps sell that experience more than isolating people inside headphones. But it just really, really depends on what kind of project you're making. Mm. Yeah, we had, we had some issues at the beginning of the launch, just like the day before we were launching, about thinking, thinking it right and making sure that it all fit with what was going on because there was a few times I'm putting it on and we had, like, birds flying around and you'd hear the bird before you see it, you know? It'd go... <laughs> and then a second later it's gone and you're like, OK. So those little sync issues that we had, we had to make sure it was sharp and... There was a lot of um, talks around who's at fault, what's going on, is it the headset, is it the museum, is it our programming, what's going on? Yeah, it's, a, um, it's a super hard technical problem. It was, I spent eight a lot of voices problem, going, exactly. who is it, what's going on, can we find the problem? Um, and that, it took a whole day to kind of make sure we got it right. In the end they did, thankfully. Um, I think it was a small problem too that no one knew about. Um, but yeah, I remember several issues with that, but... Um, I, I remember once we got it on, my, my partner, she's like got a bird phobia too, so there was, in, in our film there's a lot of birds flying around. <laughs> and so we synced it up nicely and she got scared, so I was like, yes. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> she's like, ah! But again, that, that's a good example of how powerful this is as a medium. Yeah. Yeah. We've had people kind of freak out before on, on like drone shots because they have yeah. a fear of heights and all those kinds of things. But it shows you how powerful that really is. I just wanted to ask Ian if there was an example of something that you felt was um, not salvageable from the live experience when you translated it into XR and similarly something that you gained in the XR that you couldn't have achieved for audiences in the live experience. Ah, great question. Um, yeah, so the big thing that we wanted was to make sure that it's still intimate and um, small enough, because the, the, the show was so intimate and people really opened their hearts and their minds and their ears to listen to the story 
And so we wanted to keep that within the VR, which was a great medium to do so. Um, some of the elements in the live show that, because we thought it was as simple, at the beginning we thought it was simple as just planting the camera, doing the show, and then letting the audience see that. But we quickly discovered we had to shift. Um, elements like the spear throwing we were trying out, but again, I didn't want anything too hectic. I get sick, like I said. So just those little elements that can kind of make you go a bit funny. We just wanted to keep the camera still and um, have the movement happen around a lot of the time. We did use some droning shots, which were quite calm and um, slow anyway. Um, so the spear throwing didn't make the cut from the live show. The dancing um, elements didn't make the cut, but the smoking did, which was beautiful. Um, the fire, sitting at the fire at the end, there was a, um, something about fire, something about us all just looking into fire. Um, so that was one of the big um, moments of feedback from the VR film was the fire, a lot of the um, just staring into the fire. Um, and, yeah, so, and, and the bridge as well. There was an element where we began the show with so much noise. You walk over the bridge where the freeway is, it's so noisy. You've got trains and cars and, like, it's like... And then you get down to the lake and it softens and it silences up a bit. Um, so that beginning, that, that hectic beginning of just, you know, yeah, um, cars and chaos and a city and concrete and that whole establishment of just bang, here's some concrete and then here's some smoke. Um, let's go back a few thousand years. Um, it was beautiful, so we wanted to keep that element too. So the, uh, we began some of the VR with the bridge as well and having that was, it got a bit dangerous at, at times with my son, um, but we, we were all okay, yeah. There was another one over there and maybe one there as well. I was from the uh, Gallup experience a few days ago, if I'm correct, but this is a question directed to Ian uh, regarding the experience. Do you plan or want to do other historical events in the future? Other other projects or other... Other video? historical events in a way similar to the Gallup one? 100%. Yes. Um, Gareth asked me that earlier too and said, would you do it again? And like, what? how's the process been? And I'm... I, as a, as a theatre actor and performer and artist, like I said, I, I love being on stage. And I've done other little acting gigs in front of film and camera and I've just hated it. Like, just do not like film because of the, the time and the energy and I, I just like that. I love that adrenaline of live performance. And so every, every film that I've done, I've had a bad experience with. But I don't know, there was something about this 360 experience that was different. Um, I don't know whether that's in context to what I created and the story and because of my role and having that lake and the family around it, but even, even you know, the production company that we worked with, they were, they were just, you know, adopted into the family. Um, and so we all just quickly became close friends and my, my son called the VR camera Jason. Um, so it was that kind of feeling around it, and I really, really enjoyed the process. Um, so yeah, I would, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Um, don't know what it is yet. <laughs> don't know what it is, but come up. Hopefully, there's some ideas um, if you mob join the the hackathon. Eh? Get some ideas float, floating around. It's really funny. We called our camera Tony. <laughs> it's a thing. They, they have personalities. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one thing I would actually say as well is. Um, sort of, again, going back to technical stuff, now is actually an ideal time for artists to actually get into XR. Um, and I say that simply because over the last decade, and we're talking mostly about VR, but there is also augmented reality stuff as well. It's a shame Natalie's not here because she's the she, yeah. person on that. Um, but yeah, so over probably the last eight to ten years, we've really been solving all the technical problems of how to make this stuff, how to make the hardware and, and, and sort of get all that happening. We've got like cost-effective sort of headsets now could be a bit cheaper, but they're still okay. But now we're at, actually at an ideal time where it, it's time for artists to come in and start making really worthwhile content for the platform. And there is a massive desire for this content. I, the, I think uh, the last numbers I saw for VR headsets around the world, they're, they're 
growing, I think it's like 20 million in store base now, but it's growing year on year exponentially now, and people are really hungry for content. There's actually not enough content at the moment for, for the demand. So it's ideal to get in, get in now. I think there was another question. Did someone have their hand up with that? Um, so when you created prototypes and you said they didn't work for the bigger companies, um, I've always found that a challenge. Um, I'm more working with augmented mixed reality stuff um, in finding what software can I use to create an idea before actually going out and spending the money and, you know, mm. getting the hardware and, you know, like how do you get that idea across, that prototype across? And you said it didn't work. Is that, was that uh, a part of it? Yeah, well, it wasn't so much it didn't work. Um, it was more just getting those big corporations to change how they were doing things was going to take a long time to convince them of that, especially in, in training. They've been doing the same sort of training for like 20 years and getting them to shift. It's, it's difficult. Um, uh, we have the advantage, like, we're a development studio, so, you know, we've got programmers and artists already on, on hand. Um, you, you can still put together stuff pretty quickly. So, so we're a Unity studio, Game Engine Unity. Uh, there's also Unreal as well. You, you can actually put stuff together fairly easily in that just for... What did you say, Unity? Yeah, so Unity's a game, game um, development piece of software. Um, and there's Unreal as well. Uh, they, they sort of have templates for doing VR stuff now, which does make it easy. You still have to have some technical ability to sort of import 3D models or textures or video or whatever you want to use. Um, so it is getting easier, but I think, I think the, one of the purposes of the hackathon is to sort of partner artists with technical people, and I think you're still going to be in that boat for quite a while. You're going to have to find a technical part partner to help you do that. Yeah, I've learnt that. Yeah. And I'm sorry, we're, we're actually in short supply at the moment. We're, we're struggling to find people locally to hire at the moment, so we're starting to look online. But that, that is a great thing. Like you can actually find people remotely online now. We're all used to working on, online thanks to COVID. So... Thank you. Does that help? I think we've got time for one more question, if anyone has one. Yeah. Is that Zach up the back? Hey, if you're looking for a 3D artist, there's one right there. <laughs> Zach, he's awesome. He works for us. <laughs> um, mine was... A little bit of a weird one. I'm an audio describer that previously volunteered as a guide at the Art Gallery of Western Australia. And I was just curious as to how you could embed audio description into a VR experience. Has that been something that's been explored? Uh, actually, accessibility is a huge thing in VR at the moment. Um, it's getting to the point now where most of the platforms where you distribute your content are actually going to start requiring you to have accessibility features in there, things like subtitles and, and other like vision-based things. Um, it, uh, I don't have any really good examples of, of people who've done this yet, but it is definitely a thing that, that is happening. We did a project for um, uh, Co3, they're a contemporary dance company here in, in Perth, um, last year. Uh, we, we did like a little. We did a big project with them, but we did a little project with them previously to that. So they put on live shows, um, and we built this little app for them. It, it wasn't VR or anything, uh, but basically it allowed them to have like a, a director's narration over a live show, and we were able to sync that just on a mobile app. So you could go to the show, play your app, plug in your headphones, and listen to uh, narration. So is that kind of stuff happening? Mm, yeah, I got a I got a niece who's um, deaf, and she chipped me, well, she told me off because there was no subtitles in the VR when she went and watched it with all the family. Afterwards, she's like, where's the subtitles, you know? And she told her mum and her mum had to translate through me. Um, and, yeah, I just, I didn't even, it didn't even register in my mind about that until that moment. Um, and then I went, of course, you know? So, yeah, and I felt very embarrassed and, and shame and I went, I promise next time we'll make sure when we go to the schools that we'll have that option. And so we're looking at that before it pushes out to schools so that everyone gets a chance to kind of at least get subtitles involved. But audio description is a whole other thing. I'm, I'm not sure how we'll yeah, push it's, through. It's quite tricky because yeah. where, where do you put them? Yeah. You know, because you're in this 360 environment and if someone's not looking in the right place, they're going to miss the subtitle. Yeah. Yeah. You have to kind of design a system that, I guess, moves with your where you're looking and gives yeah. you the subtitles. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So you explain things before So you can explain things before the actual experience as well. So it's not just, you know, in real time. Um, there is also the other option of having um, people do have a dual experience. You know, just like in a gaming environment. So there are ways around it. Anyway. Yeah. Some, some of it's also just good um, uh, UX design, especially in the kind of game stuff. So things like, uh, I have seen some games do subtitles um, and they put them in very specific places and it's like a real-time 3D world. But then you can turn on like indicators which will point you towards the subtitle to draw your attention, things like that. Mm. I think we might wrap it up there. Um, but yeah, please come join us at the Alex Hotel Mezzanine. We've got some food on. So yeah, it'd be great to see you there. And thank you so much, um, Gareth and Ian, for sharing your experience with us today. About the hackathon? Oh yeah, if you have questions about the hackathon, come and talk to me at the Alex um, or grab me in the foyer. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.